Chapter 79 Blue It takes a minute for me to realize I'm awake. It's dark and cold, and there's something pressing into my shoulder hard enough to make me wonder exactly what book I left in the bed. It takes a few seconds for my mind to come back to me. A few seconds of me squirming around, searching blindly for the blanket I must have crawled out of, before I'm able to interpret the things around me correctly. Too much time, before I stop and pull my hands back to my body, pressing my chilled fingers to my chest in a bid to preserve whatever measure of warmth I can generate. I'm not in bed. I didn't misplace my blanket. I don't have one. My shoulder hurts because I've rolled onto an uneven spot on the ground. It's not dark because I've woken up in the middle of the night. There's just no windows here. I'm not in bed. There's a clinking of metal as I try to roll over onto my side. The chains are loose. They allow for a measure of movement in the space, but I haven't earned the right to run around unfettered. Not yet. Maybe not ever again. Idly, I'm amazed that the metal can still be cold. I've been wearing the chains for a long time, but I seem to only be able to warm the contact points for a few seconds. Whenever I shift, it's always cold. It's always uncomfortable. It's a stupid problem. The chains are at a good length, they aren't tight, and I'm allowed space to move. I've had worse. I have more immediate problems anyway. My mouth is dry. Too dry. Did I sleep too long? I wonder if that's possible, to sleep so long you start causing your body problems. It feels like my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth, and the more I blink, the more I recognize the pain pounding in my temples. Why am I here? The question comes to my mind unbidden, and my addled brain swims with a fog like it's been steeped in syrup. I understand the pieces in an abstract way. What I see makes sense, even if I don't really understand the greater context. I've seen it before, and I know what it means. But there's nothing there when I try to think of an explanation, when I try to think about a why. My mind drifts away from me, slow like cotton fluff, as some detached part of me reminds me that I'm cold and thirsty. My skin feels tight and itchy. My brain continues to make a little list of things that are wrong when I feel the shooting pain in my back as I sit up. I press my lips together to stop the noise before I remember there's no point in stifling the whimper. There's no one here. I could cry and scream and I wouldn't disturb anyone. And they wouldn't hear me. Some part of me corrects. The pain is jarring. So much so that it pushes the clouds out of my head. It clears my mind as I look over the room with new eyes. I remember now. I remember what happened. Yes, master. I say it as clearly as I can, as loud as I can force myself. It feels wrong. It feels wrong and it makes me feel slimy inside, as though I'm doing something wrong, calling my new master by his title in the bedroom of my old one. Old master. Something about that makes me shudder, an action I do my best to disguise. I never thought that I'd be calling Kara that. All right. Good. Kalu smiles. I can't help the way my stomach turns at the praise. The words are right. I should be happy. I should be glad that my master sees fit to praise me so early, and yet all I feel is nauseous. Now, let's go. Kalu speaks, and once again my heart drops to my stomach. I don't want to leave... I don't want to go, but I have no place here anymore. Kara's sold me. I don't belong to him anymore. I don't belong here. 
I try to ignore the stinging behind my eyes. It would be unseemly to cry here, now, in front of my new master and his friends. It wouldn't be right to press my face into the sheets and breathe in the scent of my old master. It would be incredibly rude and undignified. Still, the temptation is there. I press my hands together so tightly that I can see my knuckles turn white, but I keep my feet planted where they are. This will be the last time I'm in this room. I try not to let it feel as sudden or as final as it does, but there's nothing I can do about reality. I doubt that Kara would want to share me. He's had plenty of time on his own to make a move. There's no way he'd contact them again just for me. Kalu and his friends don't seem like the type to make house calls. No, they seem more the share-at-a-party type. My eyes dart around the room like it will matter, like it's important to take in the sight one last time, as though the space between the door and the line of bookshelves is relevant, like the desk matters, or the pillows, and the sheets will... My heart stops for a second as I register the little yellow triangle sticking out from under the covers, my plushie, from what seems like so long ago. It's stupid, childish, but I want it. If nothing else, I want it because it will be soft. It will smell something like Kara. It will be proof that this whole episode wasn't just some incredibly vivid fever dream. Master said it was mine, back when that meant Kara. He said it wasn't his. It wasn't something he was letting me use. It was something that he was trusting me to have. He said he wouldn't take it away, and I could do whatever I wanted with it. He couldn't get mad if I took it. It was mine. He, yes, master, um, I stutter, the response long overdue as I try to think up some kind of way to bring up the matter without sounding terribly rude. What is it? Kalu questions one eyebrow arching as he cocks his head to the side, looking me over like a particularly interesting problem. My throat gives an uncomfortable squeeze. It's not just him. The other two are looking at me. I can feel their eyes on me. It's now or never. May I, um, take some of my things? I say quietly wringing my hands together as subtly as I can. I'm not prepared for the giggling. The quiet little bout of laughter Jay falls into before my master is speaking again. They're not your things, Kalu says, speaking slowly, like he's trying to explain something to a particularly slow child. They're your master's things, and personally... I find that a little insulting. What? The question isn't even out of my mouth before he cuts me off again. You want so badly to come to me, bearing the mark of another person? He asks, low and accusatory. I didn't mean to offend, I answer quickly, tucking my chin to my chest and looking down at my feet. I was stupid. I phrased it wrong. I want to take back the words the last few seconds so that we can go back to the praise that had sounded so wrong in my ears. I'm new, so very new, and I'm sorely out of practice. I can't have my master mad at me before we even get to his house. But you did. Kalu says it slowly again, like he needs to explain it to someone too dumb to understand it any other way. There's a harsh edge to his voice that I don't like. It sounds dangerous. I have the uncomfortable thought that this master is the type to calculate punishments rather than strike in the heat of the moment like I'd previously thought. Then again, he had hit me when he was mad, too. I have to suppress a flinch as I see the tips of his shoes enter my field of vision. 
I don't want to look up. I don't want to see if he wears his anger plainly on his face or if it will just be a cold, indifferent mask. Give me that collar. The demand has my hand jumping to my throat. The painful, constricting feeling has nothing to do with the loose treated leather around my throat. I should have known that I wouldn't be allowed to keep it. I would have had to give it up at some point. It's another master's collar. It's demeaning, and a new master would never keep the old symbol, but still, I didn't think I'd have to give it up so soon. I still remember finding this collar, before Kara had ever presented it to me, back when I thought I'd never be able to earn it, back when the thought of being given a trust collar was the greatest freedom I could ever dream of. It wasn't made out of some precious material, but I still liked the treated leather more than something pretty that needed to be welded on. It meant something that with this collar, my master would have trusted me if he ever fixed it too tightly, that I could take it off completely if the skin underneath rubbed raw, or just adjust it without my master's direct involvement. It was something for good pets something for trusted pets. That wasn't me. Not anymore. Not with this master. It will take time to earn that kind of trust. On the other hand, it's not something that Avery's been able to manage with all her time under this man. That doesn't give me much hope. My hands shake as I find my way to the clasp. It's more effort than I've ever expended in a simple task. I can feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears as my fingers slip over the smooth leather and I fumble. I'm taking too much time. I can tell because Kalu gives a huff at my movements, but he makes no move to stop me or to help. No, this is my task. I'll remove the remnants of my last master's ownership myself, so I don't come into my new master's care transgressing. Eventually, it comes undone. The buckle is designed to be undone quickly, and without any other intricate decorative bits, the process isn't overly complicated, even in my unsteady hands. The bell jingles noisily free to swing about as it pleases now that it's no longer around my neck. I don't know why, but the sound makes my heart ache, perhaps because the noise had become something to announce my presence, something that always made Kara stop what he was doing to look over at me, to smile and wave me closer. Kalu stretches out his hand, palm up, expectantly. I press my lips together and force myself to breathe through my nose. This man is my master now. I have to obey. I have to be good. My hands shake as I hand over the collar. It's not mine anymore. And I try not to feel the ache in my chest as Kalu throws it aside. The bell jingles when it lands, and I'm fairly certain that it landed somewhere on the bed. It's a conscious effort not to look over at it. I risk raising my head a fraction. I took too long, but I did what he said. I followed orders. I was good, right? My master's face is impassive. He doesn't betray any kind of emotion as he looks down at me. His eyes are cold, and there's no hint of the warm, teasing emotion that had been there when they pulled me from under the bed. I don't understand what I've done wrong, but that's the only conclusion that I can draw from the tense atmosphere. I must have done something wrong. Kalu would have said something. He wouldn't be looking at me in such a way otherwise. There must be something I did wrong. I've offended him again. Did he really find it that disrespectful that I took so long to give him my collar? Or is it something? Strip. The order comes harshly, and I can't help the way I flinch. I look up at my master before I can even think about the impropriety of the action. Master's face remains impassive, but 
His eyes bore into me like he's studying me for something I can't see. I force my head down before I can dig my grave even deeper. This man is not Kara. He will not provide the same leniencies when it comes to matters of proper etiquette. He is not likely to be as tolerant. Either way, I have orders. I try to push away the uncomfortable feeling that settles in my chest as I bunch up the loose fabric at the bottom of my shirt. I'm not wearing anything particularly fancy. I've gotten used to the plain, comfortable night clothes that mass that my old master allowed me. Kara didn't require fancy, ornamental things be worn for his amusement. It'll be odd to strip like this in front of my master without any real plan for seduction. Maybe that's why this feels so wrong. The shirt goes over my head, and while I'm not making a show, I go about it slowly. I don't know if Master was anticipating a show when he made his order, so I will give him time to make himself more clear if that was what he truly wanted. He doesn't stop me, so I let myself continue. Slow, but not exactly sensual. I can't help the way the blush rises high on my cheeks when Cat starts giggling. I know it's not the standard for felines, or the standard all around. But the plain, solid fabric under things are comfortable. They aren't pretty, they don't have any fancy lace or ribbon, just a simple elastic band. Most of the ones that came in the set are a flat, singular color, so there's not a lot of variation, but apparently Kara went through a lot of trouble to track down a set like this for my kind. It was something I had trouble adjusting to. I let my face fall to the floor again as I force the tension out of my shoulders, letting my hands hang limply at my sides. There's an urge to cover up. There always was. But it's gotten easier to put those thoughts away. They can look. It's their right. They get to decide. Well, this is certainly interesting. Kalu chuckles along with his friends as he steps closer two fingers finding their way under the elastic band. He pulls, lightly, like he's trying to coax me closer with just his touch. I'm about to move when he releases it, letting the elastic snap back against my skin with a harsh smack. I flinch away from it before I can think. It didn't hurt too badly. A little worse because it was right against my stomach, but it didn't truly hurt. I know what they could do, and this barely counted as a correction. I hadn't realized that I gave you this pair, Kalu continues, the smile in his voice unchanged by his actions. I... what? Um... I stutter and stumble, trying to piece together some kind of coherent thought. It might have helped if I understood in any way what I was in trouble for. Master's voice is harsh once again, and I don't even understand what I did wrong this time. I believe I ordered you to strip. I did mean for you to remove all the articles that belong to another master. Kalu lets the statement hang there as I feel my face heat. Right. Of course. I have no right to feel so bashful. Experience alone should have cooled the flush in my face, and yet, when I stand bare before them, I can't help the way I bite at my lip, or the conscious effort it takes to keep my hands from covering myself. Ah! Cat's voice is so loud, so close behind me that it's a struggle not to jump at her words. Those scars kind of ruin the picture, don't you think? She says it like it's my fault. Ruined. Pretty. Interesting. The words bounce around in my head so much that I'm starting to think they don't actually have a meaning. The more they're used, the less sense they make. The more it all becomes jumbled sounds. 
like it was my choice that my masters beat me so hard they left marks, or decided they wanted marks on me in the first place. I'm trembling as she runs a finger over my hip and up my back, tracing a straight line through the crisscrossed lines that I know are there. There's nothing I can do, so I simply hold still and wait for the verdict. Pretty? Ugly? What'll it be this time? Something treasured to break cleanly into pretty pieces? Or something smashed into so many pieces that the only fun left would be to grind it into dust? Oh, don't be such a snob! It's Jay's voice this time as I blink myself out of these thoughts. They're bad. They're dangerous. I only need to please my master. That's the only thing I need to remember. I think the scars actually enhance his looks. Come on, cat. You look at him and tell me that you don't think a little more creatively. Cat's quiet for a moment, and though she's behind me, I can almost hear the way she purses her lips at the suggestion. She traces over some of the worst with the tip of her nail, running over the areas with a careful precision that I don't know how to interpret. Well, I guess I can see a world where you're right, Cat murmurs almost under her breath, and I don't want to know what she means by that. I don't want to think. A shiver runs through my body before I can suppress it. You cold, baby? Kalu intones sweetly, and it's all I can do to pull my thoughts from the nails tracing over my back and remember how to speak. Yes, I answer honestly, barely remembering the Master, that now needs to be tacked on to those simple responses. All right, all right, Cat says, sounding resigned as she takes her hands away from me. I try not to fidget, but the curiosity is a bit overwhelming. They won't let me wear my old master's clothes, but I don't see a bag on any of them. They can't make me walk out of here naked. Well... I suppose they could, but this is a residential neighborhood. One of my old masters got a fine for that once. I'm pretty sure you aren't supposed to do it. It seems they come to the same conclusion as Kalu heaves a sigh and unties the front knot of his cloak. I suppose it can't be helped, he sighs dramatically as he drapes the cloak over me. I try not to get lost in the overwhelming folds of fabric. It's an aristocrat's cloak. And it's winter. The thing is surprisingly heavy, but also blissfully warm. And in all likelihood, the only offer of clothing that I'm going to get. It takes no coaxing to make me wrap myself in the garment. I'm taken aback by the scent it carries. I've never been close to Kalu and I've certainly never had the desire to scent him. But wrapped up in his coat, it's not so much a conscious decision as the only choice I have if I want to breathe. Kalu's scent reminds me of a tea Kara had made me try, something dark with very bold flavors, malts and cinnamon, something that might have been flowers drowned out in the background. I'd almost choked the first time I drank it. I wasn't prepared for the powerful astringency that had followed such a pleasant aroma. I hate the way my eyes sting at the memory, the way I swallow reflexively. It doesn't help to stave off the choked feeling at the back of my throat. I'm not sure why I thought it would. I do my best to follow docilely to not look up from my master's shoes as we make our way out. They have a carriage waiting for them. Of course they do. There's some part of me that feels ashamed. I hadn't known why they were coming over, and so I'd hid like a child. I'd made them wait. I tuck my chin to my chest and resolve to do better. I have to do better. I can't let that infraction dictate how this will end. I need to be good. There's no praise for it, 
but Kalu and Jay seem appreciative when I hold the carriage door open for them with the hand that's not holding my cloak closed. Cat takes the door from me and waves me to go ahead. I try not to jump when she takes the opportunity to pinch my ass through the heavy cloth. It's the most I can do. But the carriage occupants don't seem too disappointed about that. I do my best not to think as I settle on my knees and the carriage jerks into motion. The movement causes me to stumble a little, but I quickly right myself. It's happened before. With Kara. I'm clumsy in a carriage. I know that. The constant movement makes me sick if we're traveling for too long, and the bumping from the uneven road will make me wobble like a fawn taking its first steps. I've bumped into Kara almost every time we've ridden together, but he had helped me to my feet, insisted that I sit beside him, or at least let me lean into his legs so that I could close my eyes and pretend that the motions weren't making me nauseous. There's a hand on my head before I know what's happening, and my hands clench into fists so tightly that I'm sure I've left little crescent indentations in my skin. I didn't flinch. I didn't try to get away. There's a horribly proud part of myself that's happy about that. It would do me better to forget it. Forget all about it. And the master that's joined the list of all the other masters who never made sense. It was all a dream anyways. Every day it was more and more unbelievable. Kara and all the weird stuff that came with him. All the little rules that never made sense. All the privileges that I'd never even asked for. It was better if it was all a dream. Oh, come now. There's no need to be so distant. It's Master's voice, and while I incline my head, I know that I haven't been allowed to look at this man. The order comes without words as Master spends a lazy second dragging his fingers through my hair. I don't know what he's like. I don't know how much of this attention I'm going to get. So I trace the pattern on the carpet below me as he indulges me with this soft touching. Eventually... His fingers go to my chin, and I follow as docilely as I can, letting my eyes fall to one side so I'm not looking directly at him, but raising my head like he's directing. So pretty. He says it almost to himself, so quietly that I'm not sure I was meant to hear. I don't think I could respond even if he allowed it. I don't think the compliment was meant for me. It was more objective than that, not unlike someone praising a painted face. Pretty, but that didn't mean he was trying to compliment the porcelain. How about we put that mouth to use? It comes in that same low tone. It's not a question, so I don't even bother with a response. Something in my chest clenches, but I do my best to ignore it. I didn't expect any different, and yet I hadn't thought it would come so soon. I thought I would have a little time to collect myself, to push the annoying, rapid thoughts out of my head or the sick, churning feeling out of my gut. It's nothing that I haven't dealt with before. Nothing that should get in the way of going through with my master's orders. I let a smile come over my face. It's harder than I thought it would be to force the corners of my mouth to quirk into something shy and demure, to settle myself between my master's legs and nuzzle into his inner thigh. He allows the casual touch as I make quick work of the laces and ignore the way my hands are shaking. I can be good. I know how to be good. It's different with orders. My body moves by itself like it has taken my mind right out of the equation. I have enough experience to do this with my eyes closed, but most don't like it that way. I keep my eyes open and try to make it enjoyable. I don't know much about my new master, but I know what makes people feel good. 
personal preferences change little things, but the basics usually stay the same. It's a little difficult, if only because my tongue is naturally a little rougher than I'd like, than they'd like, the bad part of my mind chimes in, and I can feel some deadened impulse to flinch away, to tense and pull away. But there's a hand on my head, stroking through my hair softly, a reminder that this is where I am meant to be, a reminder that I shouldn't squirm, that it would be so easy to bite down, and that would end very poorly. Car- my old master had done this for me. The memory comes back too quickly, when I desperately didn't want to see it in the first place. That was the first time I'd ever been on the receiving end of this. The first time I'd understood why this felt so good. Why my masters had requested these kinds of things so often. I thought it would be different the next time this happened. I thought it would have been my old master, and we'd find a way for this not to hurt so much. We'd do one of those long talks that he so favored, and it would be easier. Master's nails drag gently over my skin as his fingers pull free of my hair to trace down my neck. That's fine. I try to bring my mind back to my body, but it's no help. I should be focused. I should be attentive. But it's so much easier to let myself pull away. Master's hand traces further down my body, running over my collarbone and then down my shoulder. Absently, I'm aware that the cloak has slipped just down the one shoulder, but the way the heavy fabric falls, it's only clinging to where it's been draped over the other shoulder. It's cold, the chill immediately setting into my exposed skin. I don't move to correct it, even though it exposes more than a tasteful amount of my back. I don't have the energy to even think about it. I focus on the motions, done in rote so many times that my mind immediately pulls away the more I try to focus. Master coos something in a gentle voice, and it takes everything I have to listen. He didn't deserve you, he says, more warmly than I thought he was capable of. Not a place at that school, or a proper familiar. I try not to feel the sting of the words. I was being stupid, thinking that he could have meant something else, that I might find myself treasured. I wasn't a proper familiar, but I was enough to get Kara through the semester, more than enough for Master to say I was worth something. It's an odd thing to praise, especially when voicing contempt for another, but I try to take it in a good way. Master thought Kara hadn't deserved me, but that had nothing to do with me at all. It was just that Master thought a commoner shouldn't be at his school, taking up a familiar that might have gone to another skilled mage. It's not for me. The thought hurts more than it ought to. Just because this Master happened to hate c My old Master did not mean that he'd have any affection for me. I guess he knew that, too. Master coos softly as his hand goes back to my hair, petting softly before he tangles his fingers in the longer bits at the back of my head. Without meaning to, I can feel my eyebrows pull together as I try to puzzle through the words he's saying. My mind's working so slowly that it's all I can do to remember the motions, to stay focused on the task I've been given. But my mind circles back, confused as to why my master would give Kara any kind of warm acknowledgement. After all, he continues, even after all you did as a familiar, you're a much better whore. It's all the warning I get before my head is pulled forward into my master's lap. It's too quick, too much, 
There are tears in my eyes as I push away the impulse to thrash. It'll do me no good. Not with the iron grip Master has on my hair. The way he's still pulling me closer despite how my nose is pressed into his shirt. I focus on trying not to gag, on breathing through my nose. I blink away the wetness in my eyes. It wouldn't do to cry at just a little bit of rough treatment. I can take it. I have taken so much more. This shouldn't be a problem. I used to be good at this. I used to be good. The carriage ride isn't too long. Or maybe it was, and my mind went away again. I wasn't all there, I don't think. It was easy to fade into that place where my body wasn't my own, where my mind stayed separate, even with the task I've been given to distract me. I hate the nauseous feeling in my gut, the way my knees hurt and my legs feel numb. It didn't used to be this bad. Kara didn't have anywhere to go, didn't require the use of carriages very often. But it never got like this. Maybe we did go farther than I'd thought. The memory comes back to me before I can force myself to think of something else. Kara had let me lean on him, had let me sit on the chair or lie across his lap. He'd describe what he saw out the window. He'd explain things and take up all the awkward moments with the sound of his voice. I shut the memory out, bury it as deeply as it will go. The windows in this carriage are higher and narrower than most. And with how occupied I am, I doubt any of the occupants would take it upon themselves to narrate our journey. Eventually, blessedly, we arrive at the servant's entrance. There's a rough jerking as the carriage has to be turned around because the driver went too far. But when the carriage stops rolling, I'm ready to press my head to the ground and kiss it for being solid and immovable. There's no one around. It's a bit odd that the house is so deserted, but it's not unheard of. It's late in the day. Everyone might be busy. Either way, I try not to look the blessing over too carefully as I remind myself to readjust my master's cloak to cover me. I keep my eyes on the floor and try to ignore the blush that rises on my face. It's a stupid thing to get embarrassed about. It'll probably go ho away with time. I'd just gotten used to wearing clothes, often. It'll take a bit of time to adjust, but I will manage. There's a moment of worry that I won't adapt quickly enough that I'll annoy my master with my impertinence and things will go poorly. I shiver in the wake of the open door, the cold air forcing me to drape the cape over my shoulders quickly, holding it closed as much as I can from the inside. I hate the unsteady feeling it causes in me, how quickly it snaps my mind back into my body. The new calculations that enter my head, how many steps it will take before I am inside, how much that's going to hurt my bare feet. It's not bad. It's not too bad. I've had worse. They don't have any interest in lingering in the entryway or making me wait out in the cold. Stars no. I've had worse than a little cold from the outside path. We're inside the house before I know it. I don't know why we're using the servant's entrance. I don't know why my master would use the side entryway in his own house, let alone with two of his friends. It's probably because of me. The thoughts come unbidden. I doubt they would have used the service entrance if they weren't bringing in a familiar pet. I'm a pet now. Again. My head hurts as I try to rationalize it. I doubt I'll be used as a familiar. They seemed more interested in my other skills. I wonder if Avery got to come in through the front entrance. It's a stupid thought, one that I quickly try to push from my mind. There's really no comparison between us. She's a purebred. I'm a mutt. She's a familiar. 
well-trained and important, and I'm not. I have little enough value as something ornamental. There's no need to go through the motions to pretend I might be more significant. I follow as quietly as I can, ignoring the way I can feel Cat's eyes on me, the devious glint in her gaze as I try to hold the cloak as tightly shut as I can. Modesty has little place in my life, but Cat seems to find it amusing. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Eventually, we find our way into a little sitting area. It's got a plush rug and a long, soft sofa and two cushioned chairs with a short table between them. The windows are covered, but I doubt they're hiding any great view. We didn't climb any stairs on our path here. This room doesn't look too well used. Perhaps the curtains are a bid to stave off the cold that comes from such large windows. I have to shake the thoughts out of my head. I don't know why I'm putting so much effort into thinking, when it would be so much safer to just keep my head down and let my mind go blank. I shouldn't be thinking. Or rather, I should at least have the decency to think about my new master and his friends. I don't know what they want with me here. It is fairly obvious that this is not a personal room. It doesn't seem well used, so I can't imagine there's a good reason to be using it just for me. It certainly isn't going to be my new sleeping place. There's nothing here for me anyways. Why am I here? I force the tension out of my body and stare blankly at the low table. It does me no good to question my master. It only brings trouble. His friends are here, and more than anything, that means I should be on my best behavior. I can't ask what's going on. Speaking before my master addresses me would be disrespectful. Cat takes off her coat and throws it at one of the chairs. There's a tray in the corner that I didn't see. A little maid's cart with wheels that has artful bottles and cut crystal glasses. Kalu makes his way over only sparing me a backwards glance as he makes some indecipherable motion with his hand and says, Sit down. There's movement in the room, the sound of the other two people shedding their heavy layers, but neither of them sit. Instead, the sound's quiet, and I can feel eyes focus on me. He... he couldn't have meant me, right? Before Kara, I'd almost never been allowed to sit in my master's presence, especially not when they remained standing. I'd been told to kneel, to stand, to present right on the floor before them. But I'd never been told to sit. I pull my lip between my teeth as I risk raising my head, and sure enough, they're looking at me, waiting expectantly for something. For me my mind supplies. They're waiting for me to sit. For a second, I'm sure the floor is unsteady below me, but the sense of vertigo passes quickly. The clipped order didn't sound like a drill command. Even still, I doubt they want me sitting on my heels when I'm still not a foot from the entryway. Though it was a command, he probably didn't mean for it to be immediate, not when he'd said it so casually. So, further into the room, then. But that doesn't help me, either, because while there's a fair bit of furniture in this small room, there aren't really any good places for a pet to sit. The low table takes up the central space, and that means that I would have to pick a side without knowing where Master intends to sit. It would be disrespectful to sit at the side of one of his guests when he hadn't ordered it. I let my eyes trace the outer edge of the carpet. I want that. My knees are sore, and my legs feel like jelly after the ride in the carriage. I want to have a place on the carpet. Something soft, if not exactly warm. The room is too cold as it is. I don't need hardwood floors to remind me of what I already know. As much as I crave the boon, I can't imagine I'll get it. Most of the space at the sides of the chairs is uncovered. I'll only get it if I'm allowed to be directly in front of Master, or one of his guests, and that will only happen if I please him, if I'm given the opportunity to please him, I remind myself. 
I'm taking too long. Every heartbeat reminds me that I should have chosen, that I should have complied by now. But my knees are locked under me. I don't think I could have moved if I wanted to. The back of my mouth is dry and I struggle to swallow, struggle to breathe and find a way to phrase my question that will not get me into any more trouble. Um, where? The question isn't even out of my mouth before Kalu's snapping. Stars, I said sit, didn't I? What, Kara never asked you to sit down? He prods with a sneer in his voice that has me shuddering. Jay clicks his tongue at me, waiting for my head to come up before motioning me over and patting the soft cushion on one of the high-backed chairs. I'm pathetically grateful for the instruction, but as I go to kneel beside it, he catches me by the arm and directs me into the chair. I bite the inside of my cheek as I force myself to move with him, follow the directing push of his hands. There's no mistaking our destination, but I still flinch when I'm finally seated. Kara had tried this. He'd said it was more comfortable to sit this way. He'd asked me over and over again if I felt comfortable doing this. I didn't. I wasn't. I'm still not. Jay's hand on my shoulder, holding me, reminding me that this is where he put me, is the only thing that stops me from trying to correct this. I shouldn't be sitting here like this, like a person, in a chair with my master and his friends still standing around me. It's wrong. When I'm on the furniture, I am on display, but this is not any kind of display that would be appealing. I'm still draped in my master's cloak. My feet are planted on the ground, and despite my best efforts, and my shoulders are quickly regaining their position next to my ears, something that's made a hell of a lot easier given how flatly they're pressed against my skull. There's a tremor in my hands, but I try not to feel it. I try not to acknowledge it and just take some comfort in the grounding hand on my shoulder. I whimper as the hand goes away, but I try not to move. He took his hand away because I wasn't moving. He trusts me to keep myself where they want me. I try to take pride in that. I try to let it feel good that I'm doing something right, that I'm doing what they want. There's a hand under my chin a second later, and I can feel the faint prickling of cat's nails press with a threatening, though not yet painful, pressure on my cheeks. She directs my gaze, correcting me. I shouldn't be staring at my knees. My focus should be master. I have to suppress the whine that comes with the thought. It's too late anyways. Master is upset with me, and I don't even know what I've done wrong. I'm not sure what does it, whether it's something in the way I must look like I'm about to cry, or some other impulse that sets upon him, but he takes pity on me. He only makes me hold this uncomfortable gaze for a few seconds before he tells me what I've done wrong. Answer me, Master commands, dully as though it was obvious. I feel my face color as I realize that it was probably meant to be obvious. It's such a stupid thing to get wrong, being unattentive to your master. I should be glad that he told me, that he took the time to make sure his pet understood what he was doing wrong. I've had others who would beat me until I got it right. Master is good and kind. He doesn't beat his pets for every little mistake. He gives them a chance to make things right. There's a tightness in my throat, as I realize there's more than one similarity between my old master and the newest one. Master likes verbal responses. Y yes master, Kara asked me to sit sometimes. I respond just as soon as I can get my voice to come out without the pain I feel in my throat. Master swirls the dark-colored liquid he's poured into his glass as he makes his way over. I can't help the way my body starts to tremble, something that isn't helped by the interest Cat seems to have in this new expression. Kalu stops right in front of me, his face devoid of all emotion, as he seems to study me like a bug on a slide. I let my eyes fall to his left as I try to force tension from my body. It should be easy. 
Even though I'm in an unfamiliar position, Cat still hasn't let go of my head, so I can't possibly be at fault for my posture. Still, there's nothing wrong with trying to be respectful. Really? His voice is full of feigned surprise. I'm not sure why he's bothering to put up an act when it's just me he's performing for. But he takes a pause, takes a drink from his glass, and allows himself to tower over me for a moment before he continues. I hate this. The unfamiliar position I'm in, the odd question he's asking, the dark look in his eyes as he leans down to my eye level. You wouldn't lie to me, would you, little one? My heart catches in my throat. Is that what he thinks? Does he really think I would lie over something like this? Something so inconsequential and directly to his face? Did he find my initial disobedience so severe that he thought I might actually be compelled to lie? I, I would never... I stumble over my own words in a rush to defend myself, but then Master is speaking, and my voice dies in my throat. You seem oddly comfortable saying his name. I was kidding before, but did he really get off on you calling his name? There's a humor to the question, but the hard set of his eyes reminds me of the danger lurking behind it. I open my mouth to tell him that he's wrong that my stupidity means nothing and I should have remembered my place and not used his name. But something stops me. It is odd. Out of all the allowances Kara had made, that one was particularly odd. It wasn't about kindness. It wasn't something to make me more comfortable. It was something for him. It was so easy to use his name. It guaranteed that he'd go along with anything I said. He let me call him by his name whenever I wanted. As wrong as it was, whenever I used the privilege, he would always try to be extra accommodating. Something more than simply rewarding me for my decision. It seems odd that he would have given me such a powerful thing to use against him. It wasn't sexual. It wasn't. If it were that easy, maybe Kara would have actually let me share his bed, in a more traditional way than I already was. Why would they be curious, though? My head snaps to one side as I hear the sharp crack of skin against skin. The pain comes almost a whole second later, stinging and hot as I try to repress the urge to press my hand to my face, idly. I wonder what my master's tell is, whether it was something in his eyes or his hands that let Cat get her hand out of the way in time. You will answer me when I speak to you! His voice is dark, strained with a barely repressed anger that has my heart stuttering in my chest. Fuck! I don't know how I've managed to make the same mistake twice in a row. I know I'm stupid, but Master had just told me what he required of me. He'd just let me off with a warning about this preference. This is my second infraction in as many minutes, and the thought is nearly drowned out by the way my heart is beating in my ears. How the fuck did I forget? Master had just told me, and yet I let myself cause him trouble. I let myself make stupid mistakes and forced him to punish me. I force myself to take a breath, ignoring the shaky sound I make when I inhale. It wouldn't be there if I was better. I wouldn't be in pain if I was better. I wouldn't cause trouble if I could just be good. I... I... I stumble, trying to piece together a sentence that won't dig my grave any deeper. My previous master allowed many things. Though I wouldn't say, Ah, did he like you calling out his name when he fucked you? Cat cuts in. Her crude words slice into me. It's so much worse out loud. As humiliating as the insinuation was, 
Hearing it all laid bare is so much worse. I can't control the heat rising on my cheeks or the way I squirm in my seat. I don't like this. I don't like being on the chair, surrounded. I can feel their eyes on me. I can feel their closeness, the way they encircle me. It's a wonder I can breathe. When I see Cat's hand circle around me from behind, I can't help the way I flinch away. My breath is coming too quickly, too shallowly, to the point that everything around me is a blur. I don't have much room to maneuver. Pretty immediately I bump up against the chair's armrest, then the back as I try to squeeze myself as tightly as I can into the manufactured corner. It's wrong. I know it is. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be causing trouble for my master, for his friends. But I can't stop myself. I press my heated face into the material of the cloak. It's stupid. But I feel better. I feel better when I can't see them. When I can pretend I'm alone in the room. That if I can't see them, they can't see me. The illusion is shattered not a moment after I construct it. I shouldn't be surprised. Just because I can pretend to hide doesn't mean they can't see. Doesn't mean that they can't just reach out and touch what's theirs. There's a hand on the other side of the cloak. I feel it. And while there's no room to flinch away, I still do my best to squirm. I don't like it. Even through the barrier of cal- Of master's cloak. It's too much. I hate that I can't tell who it is brushing over my ribs and stroking down my side. I bite at the inside of my cheek and hold my breath. There's nothing else I can do. Stars, am I right? Cat asks, her voice tinged with a humor that I am failing to see at the moment. Why does she sound so excited? It takes more effort than I expected to pry my face from the soft material of the cloak. The heat in my cheeks hasn't receded, something Cat seems to enjoy as she pats my cheek, encouraging me to lift my face just a little more. She is the one petting me, though the devious glint in her eye removes any of the soothing qualities of the action. I tense up under her hand, and before I can curse myself for shunning the kind, non-violent contact, she smiles down at me, as though the action was exactly what she was expecting, as though she was pleased. Why are you asking me this? I can't help the way my voice shakes, but the moment the words are out of my mouth, I know that I shouldn't have spoken them. It's impertinent, and I pay for it rather immediately. Cat's hand comes back up to my chin, but there's none of the restraint of last time. There's no feigned gentleness when she allows her nails to dig into my cheeks as she pulls my head to the side. The move exposes my neck something I only recognize a moment later when she pulls back at the cloak until it's exposed a nice column of skin. She presses a kiss to my neck, right over my thudding pulse point. It's soft and gentle, but it could so easily be exchanged for something else that I can't help the pathetic keening sound that blooms in the back of my throat without my permission. My eyes sting but I do my best to blink away the worst of the blurred mess without letting any tears fall. It would be bad if I cried. They aren't even doing anything bad. They probably don't want to see my tears. It's not pretty. Even the ones who like me crying, gasping, and begging have told me so. It spoils the picture, even when it's what they want. I haven't been given permission to cry. It doesn't keep my eyes from watering, or Cat from noticing the hitching of my breath or the way the tears are still stubbornly gathering. I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes her smile. Ah, are you a loyal little bitch? She asks, her cheery tone contrasting with her words. I hate that the tone means something to me before the words do. I hate the pathetic, pathetic 
pathetic way I almost lean into the hold she has on my face. The words came out almost like praise, and it would have been so easy to treat them as such if I could only ignore the words and just be grateful that she didn't seem to be mad or take offense. But I do understand the words. The tone does nothing to make them sting any less or temper the red on my face. I don't know why I'm surprised. It's only been a few months, but I hadn't thought that it was enough time for me to forget what I'd been trained for, what I'd been used for, for so much of my life. Funny enough, I don't think loyalty is meant to be a compliment. It wasn't really required of me at any other point. And the way Kat says it, the derision coloring her voice at the word, I wonder if I'm in trouble. It's cute. Jay speaks up. He has his finger pressed to his mouth, his brow furrowed as he looks down consideringly, like I'm some problem to be solved. But we could always just find out another way. He goes to stand in front of me. And it's only when he's reached forward to tug at the collar of my cloak that I finally realize what he means to do. I shouldn't make it worse for myself. Master is right here. He's right here in the room, and he would tell them if this wasn't what he wanted, if this went against his wishes, if they were using his pet wrong. Still, I can't stop the instinctive way I pull away from Jay's hands the pitiful little resistance I put up trying to tug the cloth back over my body. It's stupid. I've been beaten for less. But Jay pins one knee against the armrest with his leg, and Cat digs her nails into me once again, pulling me into the position I ought to be maintaining. My eyes are desperate and wild when they find my master. Kalu has wandered a couple of steps away, taking sips from his dark-colored drink. There's no emotion on his face. He watches impassively, as though what's happening in front of him doesn't concern him. I suppose it doesn't. If he wanted them off, he could say something, anything. I should stop. It's not my place to resist. It's not right. Still, I can't force myself to let go of the cloak. There's no excuse, though I try to conjure one. It's still cold in this room. The cloak is my only covering. I hate the high, warbly noise that comes out of my throat. I hate the way that they don't seem to notice my final defense, that they don't recognize the high, desperate noise as proof that I'm frightened, that I'm scared to the point of going against my conditioning. More than anything, I hate the brief flicker of interest that passes over Master's features. Kalu puts a hand on Jay's shoulder, making some motion that I can't correctly interpret with my mind pulling in every direction as it is. His eyes lift to mine, or rather, directly to my side as he acknowledges Cat. His movements are slow, but the whole world is stuttering around me as I fight for every single one of my quick, short breaths. He doesn't take the cloak from me, but his hand slides inside the folds before I'm ready. I can't help the way I jerk when I feel his fingers. Their light press against my side as he finds my right hand and pulls it out. Cat's allowed to take over, her grip unsurprisingly hard as she holds my wrist above my head. I whimper. I pull my lip between my teeth and risk looking up at where Master stands above me. I don't want this. See? See how scared I am? I don't like this. Please stop. I can't beg out loud, so I settle for keening, for looking pitiful and squirming. There's only so much of this that they should be willing to take. If I prove myself to be troublesome enough, then... Then... They might beat me. They might have their fun that way. I think I might prefer it at this point. I don't understand why this is so different. Plenty of owners have had me, 
almost all of them on the first night, frequently with friends or people that they're trying to impress. I don't know why I'm jeopardizing this. This is my first interaction with my new owner. I should be trying to please. I should be promising to do whatever they want, and at least trying to fulfill those desires. And yet, Kalu taps at Kat's hand, and she releases her iron grip on my chin. There's a moment of stiffness as I try not to work it back and forth so obviously under the direct scrutiny of my master. It hurts, but not too terribly. We'll probably be a little sore tomorrow, but that is awfully presumptuous of me. He allows my chin to rest upon his palm fingers lightly curled so that he's touching my face but not actually exerting any pressure. I hate that it feels nice, that his soft skin and gentle hold feels so blissfully like a reward after Cat's rough treatment. I whimper when he finds my other hand under the cloak. I resist as much as I can, but there's no way to pull out of his hold. Jay's got my legs pinned, Cat has my arm. All I can do is struggle in vain and try to ignore the way my stomach turns at my master's eyes. He gives the other wrist to Cat as well, and while I give a token pull, a little wiggle to test her hold, I know there's no way out of this. There's nothing stopping my master as he unwraps my body like a present, laying me bare for all his friends. He takes his hand away from my chin and presses my face somewhat sternly into the fabric backing of the chair. Stay. Master says it gently, like the admonishment is something too trivial to take his attention. I obey. I keep my cheeks pressed to the fabric, keep my ears damn near pressed to my skull. He turns away from me, as though he could dismiss the whole of my existence with a whim. What were you thinking, Jay? I heard it's real hard to train pets with weak constitutions, but what gets taught tends to stick. I don't like the smirk in his voice. He's probably used to calling out that idiot's name when he gets fucked. I jerk. I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. Master and his friends went through a lot of personal trouble to get me into the position that they liked. I should at least have the decency to be a good pet and stay where they fucking want me, but I can't. I can't. I know it's useless. Cat has no mercy in her hold, and Jay's using his whole star's damned body to pin my legs. There's no way out of this. There's no way out. I hate the humorous little chuckle that bubbles in the back of my new master's throat. I hate how the levity is mirrored in his friend's eyes when they see my distress. Oh, did I hit the nail on the head, kitty? Or do I have to test my theory? Jay's smirk tinges his words with an undue humor. I can't help the way my leg spasms, the way I try to twist and squirm though it's just making my situation worse. This can't be happening. Jay's careful when he spreads my legs, careful that I don't have the opportunity or the leverage to squirm out of his hold, careful to ensure that I can't kick out at him. How long do you think it took him to train it into him? Kalu questions casually taking the opportunity to press his glass to Jay's mouth, waiting for a nod before he tilts the drink back. I'm not prepared for the closeness of Kat's voice when she responds, right by my ear. Oh, who knows? But I'm sure this delicious little kitty never made it feel like a chore. There's not much I can do. The squirming fascinates her, that I'm fairly certain, but it doesn't stop the impulse. I want out. I don't want to listen to this. I don't want to hear it. It's all I can do to press my lips together and not scream. That would be worse. Some terribly incoherent part of my brain informs me, though I can't pull together the actual reason why. Master drags his fingertips against the inside of my thigh and my hands jerk 
curling into fists automatically before I can even remember that I'm restrained. Nothing's changed. It hasn't even been that long since Kat's taken it upon herself to hold my arms out of the way. My head hurts, and there's a nauseous, sick feeling that comes with it. I can't be malfunctioning. Not here. Not now. Not in front of a master who wouldn't make allowances for me. I force myself to breathe. It's more effort than should be used for such a basic task. My head's a mess. Thousands of things seemingly demanding my attention. Memories starting up before being overtaken by others. There's some obsessive instinct to cover myself. To turn away and put as much distance and as many layers between me and any other person. But there's no way out. Master's hand is on my face, steadying me, forcing me to look at him. He looks angry. I bite at the inside of my cheek as I can feel the tears welling up again. Stars! Why the fuck is he angry? What did I do? Am I going to have to fuck you for my answer, or are you still loyal to your old master? The question comes out harshly and I have to wonder if I've been gone for longer than I thought, if he's been trying to get my attention while I malfunctioned. I, I wasn't! I stutter. I hate the frenetic energy in my body, the way I know, even as I continue to defend myself, that I won't be able to stop it. I wasn't trained to, to call out his name. What? what? Ah, he's all stuttery. Cat cuts me off, pressing a little kiss to the side of my face. That's just too cute. You're a carrier, right? Jay's voice has me flinching. It's not really a question. He doesn't wait for my reply. You'll slick up even without lube. I can't stop myself from squirming. In the time my head's been away, Jay has settled between my thighs. And even though it's nothing more than a jerky motion as my muscles spasm, it earns me a pinch on the soft inside of my thigh. It's not enough to discourage Jay from continuing. True to his word, they don't use lube. They don't have any around. Or probably didn't want to bother with fetching any. I try not to let it hurt. He's right, technically. I produce my own slick. I should be fine. I should be fine. Knowing doesn't help. It doesn't make it better, or easier, or whatever he was trying to do by telling me what was going to happen. I'm not prepared for Jay's fingers. I'm not ready when I can feel him touching me. Most surprisingly, I'm not ready for my own body's tightness. Somehow, in the chaos, I had entirely forgotten about the prolonged stretch of celibacy I'd experienced in my last master's care. Kara and I had gotten up to mischief, but I had been left entirely alone. He's... I mean, he's actually pretty tight, Cal, Jay says, suddenly more subdued, though it doesn't stop the searching, prodding motion of his fingers. What do you mean? Master asks, quirking an eyebrow as he looks at his friend, and then more closely at me, like I'm a problem he can solve by adding his assistance. I mean, he's way too tight to be used on the reg, and it's not like Kara has a less suited familiar lying around. I wonder if I should be insulted, but right now, I have bigger problems than Jay's words. How often did your old master fuck you? Kalu asks absently, as Jay redoubles his efforts to work his finger inside me. It's rough. It's rough, and I'm out of practice, and there's no slick, and my head hurts as I try to buck instinctually away. It's wrong, and I don't want it. But the more I try to move, the more painful I'm making it on myself. Jay will keep doing whatever he wants with me, and, and my only chance is my master. He doesn't! He doesn't! I all but scream, hoping it'll make them stop, make them go slower, or use lube. It's surprise that cuts off my words. 
because they do stop. The prodding fingers withdraw, and I'm left trying to force myself to breathe, force myself to ignore the rattling of my chest and the pounding of my heartbeat in my ears. I want to leave. I want to be put away, shown to the new space they'll allow me and left alone. I want to have the little breakdown my mind is demanding in peace. I want more time before I'm called upon to do my duties. I want the freedom or instruction to prep myself. But even through the cacophony in my head, I can still hear the words Master speaks. What do you mean he doesn't? The question is quiet, not hesitant or sheepish. He's not angry. It's just quiet. He leans forward, and I flinch, babbling before he can make any threat or tell his friend to continue. He, he doesn't, I answer, praying to the stars that the direct reply to his question was enough. Asshat doesn't even know what his familiar... Whatever insult Cat's planning to bring to the discussion gets swallowed up by the angry look on Master's face. I can feel the excuses, the half-formed, ill-considered begging, everything that might make my master take pity on me, but he speaks before I can force any of the words out of my throat. You're telling me that big man on campus, who you've been with for the whole semester, didn't fuck you once? The man doesn't have a girlfriend, boyfriend, fucking anything? Master nearly growls. No, I say a half second before I consider the full implications of that question. I am right, just not entirely. Kara doesn't have a girlfriend, boyfriend, or, as Master has so eloquently put it, fucking anything. But he does still have a fiancé. There's no way these three don't know about that, though. They are close friends with Genevieve. I feel like I answered their question in spirit, just not to the letter. Kara certainly wasn't fucking Genevieve. Still, I didn't answer truthfully, and they know it. I'm shaking when Master leans in close, allowing himself to use his larger frame to his advantage as he looms over me. Don't lie to me. This fucking orphan commoner wonder doesn't fuck you and there's no reason for it? Master grinds out. The question is the only reason why I don't devolve into a useless litany of pleas. Master likes verbal responses, and he asked a direct question. He's not an orphan! I don't know why it's that I choose to shout, but it does get rid of the angry look on his face if only to replace it with confusion. What? Kalu starts, and it's all I can do to jump on the opportunity to explain myself before Master can get angry again. He, he has a family! They just don't talk! My teeth click as I close my mouth. It's stupid. An extraneous little detail that Master won't care about. It's not an explanation as to why I've brought up such an odd topic. Master doesn't seem to think it's too odd. He quirks a brow and accepts this change of pace. Well, yeah. You have a kid like that, you kick him to the curb and pretend you never had a kid at all. He huffs that stupid, stupid grin plastered over his face that makes me want to smack it off. He had siblings! I snarl, but the second the words are out, I know that I've crossed a line. I've said too much. I shouldn't be bringing up my old master. Not when I haven't been asked. Not while I'm busy trying to entertain, failing to control myself in front of, master's guests. I shouldn't have. I know it's wrong when I can see the glimmer in master's eyes, the smirk on Jay's lips. Oh, really? And he talked to you about these siblings? The question comes out teasingly, and it's all I can do to tuck my chin to my chest and try not to squirm under their gaze. N never specifically, I stutter, 
trying to find the right words to get myself out of this. I... Please, sir, I shouldn't talk about my master's affairs. Yeah, we shouldn't have been so distracted either. So sorry to make you wait. Jay pats my hip consolingly before he moves to continue playing with me. I... My voice catches in my throat. There's not much I can offer. Nothing I can promise but a willingness that I am unwilling to offer. Still... Sir, please! I whimper, but Master continues like he doesn't hear me. Yeah, why waste time talking about that old dude who only just got into the first year's program? Cat chimes in, reveling in the ripple of snickers that it causes. He tell you why he waited so long? Master chuckles, running a hand through my hair as he asks. The contact is almost nice. Almost comforting, though I don't understand why he's asking me this, why he would want an answer from me. Truthfully, I don't know why I brought my old master up. I could only register the primal, angry feeling that came with master's words. I don't know where this urge to protect the image of my old master came from. It's odd, and it will only get me into trouble. Master might be interested in it for now but sooner or later it will get me in trouble. I open my mouth to tell him to stop, that I shouldn't be saying these things about a previous master, that I don't know the answers he's asking for, when Jay seems to find a new angle, encouraged by the little bit of slick my body's been able to produce, and all I can end up making is a high-pitched whine. I heard he did his military service, and then he presented with magic. What a waste, am I right? Master chuckles, scratching at my head in a way that should be soothing. I should take what I can get. I should be grateful that my master is taking the pains to comfort me. I should be happy. But it's all I can do not to cry. Master winds his hand around my head, providing a point of stability as he directs my gaze back up towards him. Aw, come on, baby. Why won't you speak for us? Master says with a pout. The drag of Jay's fingers inside me is too much. The addition of new digits is too fast, too rough. It's been so long since, since I've had to worry about things like this. Jay stopped last time when I answered, when my response was entertaining enough to distract him from what he was doing. I heard... I... I'm speaking before I've decided on what I'm going to say. My breath is coming in little hiccupy gasps that make it hard to breathe, let alone think straight. The fingers slow, though they still work inside me for my non-answer. Is this really all right? Am I allowed to do this? Kara isn't my master anymore. I don't technically owe him my loyalty. It's not bad. It's not wrong. They could find all the information they want if they just asked. They're nobles. Mages. They have their sources. They aren't asking me for anything in depth. It's not even anything too revealing. They aren't asking for scandal material or something that could be used against him. I wouldn't give them that. I just need a little more time. I just need them to go slow and pretend I'm worth something. Not that I know anything that Car- My old master would have guarded. I don't really know anything about him. Jay presses forward, and my body protests at the strain of the stretch, making the decision for me. He s said he was- that he lied! I say it as quickly as I can force the words out of my mouth, leaving no time to question it further. Oh! Jay hums at that. I'm sickened by the slick drag of his fingers as he removes them. I hate that I'm the reason for that, that physical stimulation can force its production. But I should be glad. It saved me more times than I can count. It doesn't make me hate it any less. 
or make me any less desperate to keep him away from me. He, he said he was younger. I stutter out, trying to ignore the feeling of tears gathering in my eyes as Jay pets at the inside of my thighs. But, but he didn't s say why. I spill in a rush, desperate to get the words out. Well, how old is he? Cat asks curiously, reminding me of her presence as she pipes up. The question is so simple. It wouldn't be a problem. It's twenty-three? Cat whistles low. Well, baby, that explains it. Master quirks a grin, explaining like I'm too stupid to understand. I suppose he's right. The bastard isn't allowed to apply for the Academia until he's older. Before I can say anything, the fingers are back inside me. And I can't take it. I just need a little more time. I just... I need to prepare myself mentally, or I won't be able to handle what's in front of me. What's a few useless pieces of information? What is loyalty to someone who sold me on? It's nothing dangerous. It's nothing that can get him in trouble. I don't have names. I don't have specifics. Even with the age thing, there's no way anyone could prove it. If it's marked on his ID, then it's marked on his ID. Not even Master could just go around contesting that. There's no harm in stalling, in pursuing every advantage I have to delay the inevitable. Except that it is inevitable. Eventually, there's no distracting them. It hurts in a familiar way, being shared like this among friends. It's hard to serve a group. Inevitably, they all want different things. And when they try to have them all at once, together, it gets difficult. Cat likes to see me red likes me blushing and crying and babbling like an idiot. She likes to hit and rake her nails down my hips and hear me scream. Jay seems to prefer my mouth above anything else. He doesn't seem too interested in anything else, even though he was the one to work me open. He must like the odd sensations that my tongue provides. It's Kalu that's the trickiest. For all he likes to watch Cat make me scream, or the sight of me stretched between his friends, he doesn't seem to like anything about me in particular. He uses me, rather undemandingly, puts his fingers in my mouth to keep my words at bay, but requires nothing else. It's odd to be just a body. It doesn't take long for the overdrive my brain has kicked into to fade, for me to start losing my hold on my mind and body as they drift steadily further apart. It's easier this way, I tell myself. It's better. They can do whatever they want with me and there will be no mistakes. He's boring for such a pretty little thing, Cat says eventually, once I've stopped screaming for her once she can barely wring any kind of reaction from me. Come on now, put your heart into it, she teases. But I don't move. I'm too tired to even try to give her what she wants. Master seems to have taken notice of my little predicament. He works his hand into my hair, scratching at the base of my skull and working his fingers through the longer strands. It's all I can do to whine. I don't have the will or the energy to press into his touch. Well then, how about I call you over when he's more entertaining? Master offers with some humor in his voice. What? You're making us leave already? Cat has the audacity to sound offended as she sticks out her bottom lip and pouts. But we just started playing with the cutie just started my ass my jaw is going numb they eventually say their goodbyes 
and I only have a few moments to wipe the back of my hand over my mouth before I'm being instructed to follow. I don't fight. I don't have the strength for it. The house is big and confusing anyways, and even if I were in my right mind, I don't think I could catalog all the turns. Eventually we go through a door, down a set of stairs. I don't think about it. Don't think about the chill of the air. The lack of windows. I try very hard not to smell the musty scent of this place and the metal. I don't look anywhere but at my feet, tracking the regularly shaped stones that have at least been smoothed. It reminds me of my time with Master Trainer, and as soon as the thought comes I have to bite at the inside of my cheek to keep quiet. It's not the same place. It isn't. There were cells there. This has nothing but open space. There were windows there. This place has nothing but a little firelight. It's not the same. But I can still feel the walls closing in on me. There's no one else here. This can't be a place for pets. This isn't where Avery sleeps. There's a rattling of chain, and suddenly it's a lot harder to keep quiet. Master! I'm somewhat shocked by the soreness of my throat. The resulting raspy sound it forces my voice to take. What? Master asks, flippant as he sets up a space next to the light on the wall. I, I please f forgive the impropriety, but am I to sleep here? I phrase it as innocuously as I can. The way I said it, I might have been asking for permission rather than an explanation. Yeah, Master answers tersely, and I bite at my lip, fighting the urge to scratch at my wrist. There's no good way to phrase this next one, but I need to ask. It's eating at me, and I know I'll go crazy if I'm left in the dark. Are there any others? Despite my best efforts, I still cringe at the bluntness of my words. Not that my master seems to mind. He just continues on with a simple, No. As though my de asking demanding questions hadn't even registered. It's the no that's more troubling anyways. I can't do this. I can't be down here without others. I do very poorly alone, and alone without tasks, with only time in the dark in a room. That sounds too much like one of Master Trainer's lessons. There's no way to tell time down here, no way to understand how long Master will keep me waiting. He's not telling me how long I'll be down here, how long he expects me to stay put in the basement and pay penance. My heart stutters as I remind myself that there's no guarantee, even if he did present me with a timetable, he might just as easily forget me down here. There's no way of knowing where the room, with its staircase down into the basement, resides in this maze of a house. What if over the course of the days, my master simply forgot, forgot, or decided that I'd need more time? I'm on my knees before I can give it any more thought. Luckily, Master notices my odd behavior so that I don't have to interrupt him again with my impertinence. What are you doing? He asks, and that's all the excuse that I need to start. He asked a question. Master likes verbal responses. Please, Master, I beg of you, please don't leave me down here, I plead without shame or pretense. I don't care where else he might put me. I just don't want to be shut away. If he's this displeased, I know that I will not be attending to him in his room, but I'm confident that in a house like this, a maid or steward would find me just about anywhere else in the course of a few days. And why would I do that? He asks an angry tone bleeding into his voice. Because I'm scared. Because this is a worse punishment than you think it is. I don't understand how to beg for leniency from this man. 
but he seems to get more frustrated when I beg without thinking. A moment passes, then two, and Master seems to chuckle despite himself. Oh, what? Nothing to say now? Because you sure did cause a big stink for my friends. Are you saying that it's not my place to punish you? Ice sets itself in my chest, and I have to force myself to breathe. No, Master, please punish me as you see fit. I say the words I've been trained to give, but Master doesn't seem impressed. I see fit to not have to look at you for a little bit. So you'll be staying down here, understand? He says. There's no room for argument in his voice. Yes, Master. It's not necessary, but I answer. This Master likes verbal responses. Then get over here. The whole affair is dispassionate. My Master doesn't seem to have any interest in me now that his friends have left. There's no lingering touches. He doesn't pet me. He doesn't attempt to put me to use again. He doesn't even look at me as he fixes the shackles, turning away the second he's done. This bodes very poorly. He fiddles with something, and then looks like he's about to say something before he pushes a water base in my way and leaves without so much as a backwards glance. It's dark, too dark to see the whole place, but what I'd mistaken for faint firelight seems to be a magical stone. It glows when I move, growing fainter as I stay still. I suppose it's something so I don't go crazy. I feel absurdly grateful for the water. There's nothing presented with it, so I doubt it's for washing. And with his demeanor, I doubt he'll be back very soon. Really, I should be thankful for the consideration. I drink some of the water, trying to ignore the tight, itchy sensation in my throat, the oddly bitter flavor. It was a hell of a first day, but it's what comes next that is worrying me. No one comes in, at least no one that I see, but after I rest there's a bowl of food. It's just kibble, but it's a lot more than a single serving, so I suspect that I meant to make it last. I press my face into the water basin, allowing myself to simply suck in the water without any thoughts of propriety. My hair is wet in the action, as is most of my face, but I try not to mind it. The water still tastes odd, bitter and halfway stale, but it's water, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful, I remind myself, as though if I just say it enough it will be true. Down here, it's a little hard to tell how much time has passed. There's no suns to tell the time, let alone the day. But it feels like it's been at least more than a day. Perhaps two before my body starts demanding rest more sporadically, since the odd itchiness in my skin started. My head pounds, and I feel a heat rising in my cheeks. Even as I curl on my side, there's an uncomfortable clenching in my gut. There's a moment where I'm sure I drank too fast. That's where the sick, empty feeling inside me is coming from, but it's more than that. I feel dizzy and confused, and even though I just woke up, I want to lie down again. It's only when I curl on my side, arranging myself in some halfway decent position that preserves warmth, that I feel it. Slick. I'm slick. The surprise isn't quite enough to pierce the foggy haze. My mind moves too sluggishly to pull together all the pieces before I'm shaking for an entirely different reason. This has never happened to me before. I feel warm and tired, pliant and empty. The whole world spins and time passes in jumps. Even I'm not sure what happens in between. 
the only constant is the warmth, the want, growing more and more intense in my core. I cry and whimper, try my best to solve this newly presented problem myself, but there's nothing I can do. It's too powerful, and sooner rather than later time stutters and it all starts up again. I don't know how long I have to wait, but eventually time stutters once more, and I can see Master standing over me. His scent washes over me, even through the delirium that my body is forcing upon me. Oh, am I more entertaining now?